tonight and to, to our visitors and guests. Uh, well done for those of you on the, the third run today. Um, I feel as if tonight might be that I'm like in the afternoon session of a conference. You know, the, the, the graveyard shift. Because <laughs> I know several of you, for those of you who don't know, we had fellowship lunch here today. So we had all morning, we had a lovely lunch together. Thank you for those of you who put that on and, and got that sorted. It was a lovely time, but it's good to have you back tonight. We're going to continue in our series uh, called Real Church, um, looking at uh, what God's, God's mission. That's where we're going to be this evening. I'll say more about that in a moment. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning and for the, the time of fellowship that many of us were able to enjoy and uh, benefit from at lunchtime. Uh, right now, we want to come and ask for your, uh, your presence with us this evening uh, as we come to hear you speak and you teach us through your word to shape us. Uh, Father, we come and we simply want to bring ourselves for the, these minutes, however long it is that we're here tonight, uh, to bring this time to you, into your presence together. Hear us, be with us, be with those who aren't able to be here tonight as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, let's come and have a look at God's word. Um, let's have a reading to start. We turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. When I root what we're doing in the scriptures, I'm uh, going to dig in. Um, just whilst you're turning or while you're finding it on your devices, um, I will just flag up again. We've bought some Bibles, some NIVs that flow with the reading um, that we give. Most of the time are in the NIV. So if you find you're in church and you haven't got one, there are some in the vestibule or in the foyer uh, if you want one. So if you want to grab one now, uh, that's fine. So Genesis chapter 12. I hadn't told Martin what the reading is, so I don't know if it's going to come on the screen no, that's fine. No, we'll roll with it. We'll go back. We'll do retro tonight, which, as Martin knows, I'm quite happy with that because um, I do like us to read our own personal devices. You know, uh, I have a thing. I have a thing. Um, there we go. Now, no, it's not up on the screen. We're going to go and get the Bibles. <laughs> I have a thing that I think it's good to have your own Bible. To br I encourage you, bring your own Bible, then you can underline it. You know, if there's something strikes you, if the Lord speaks to you, you can, you can highlight it, you can write something in the margin. Then the next time you read it, you think, all oh, right, I remember God speaking to me through that and, and whatever. So I do have a, I like to encourage people to bring uh, their own Bibles. Um, Genesis chapter 12, actually, having said all of that, let's go back into chapter 11 from verse 27. A really, really foundational passage of Scripture uh, we're going to read tonight. Abraham, sorry, 11, chapter 11, verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcar. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcar and Ishkar. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, the wife of his son, Abram. And together, they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived for 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, from, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old 
when he set out from Haran. Right, come to reference that passage in a, in a little while. Um, the, set, the scene where we are, we're in our series on real church. And uh, tonight we're going to be thinking about our part in the, in the big picture uh, of God. That's what we're going to look at tonight, this, this big picture. It's a strategic time for us uh, generally. It's a strategic time for us as a church, as we're at long last moving out of the limitations and the uncertainty of the pandemic. Our church life is re-emerging after two Possibly, yeah, just over two years of pretty barren life. We, we existed on Zoom and we were thankful for it, but it's not the same as being together, is it? And uh, we had our first um, fellowship lunch today. Wasn't it wonderful? Wasn't it lovely just meeting together, eating together, spending time with each other and uh, lots of other things we're doing? You know, as we reemerge, it, it would be easy for us to, to look at the diary and of three years ago and think, right, what do we do as a church? And to restart, re, uh, reinitiate those same things that we did. This is what we do. This is our church. Let's get going with it. And now hear me right. I'm not going to knock those things one little bit. I love the fellowship lunch. I love, I love what we do. And it may well be absolutely right that we do many of the things, if not all of the things that we did before. But it would be very unwise if we simply did them because, because that's what we did before. There's nothing wrong with history. There's nothing wrong with doing what you've done. There's nothing wrong with good habits. But you want to make sure they're good. You've got to make sure that they're, they're right for the time and they're fulfilling what we're doing. Now, in this series, what we're doing, we're digging deep to make sure that we're building on strong foundations. We're digging deep to make sure that what we do as a church fits correctly with God's master plan and Paul made a great start last time uh, as he showed us from John's famous prologue John chapter 1 verses 1 through to 4 uh, that as per our strap line that you could see on pretty much all of our documentation it's all about Jesus and he I thought really helpfully made the connection between John chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1. If you weren't here or you've forgotten what he said last week, I'd really recommend go back and the sermon is online. You can catch it on YouTube. Uh, you can link it through the website. Just go to YouTube, click on Fressingfield Baptist Church. You see it. It's a really strategic uh, message that Paul gave us last time, the connection between John 1 and uh, Genesis chapter 1. I'm not going to repeat it uh, this evening. But he was showing how it's all about Jesus. What I want to ask tonight is I want to start asking the question, but what exactly is all about Jesus? What in real terms does it mean to say it's all about Jesus? In his brilliant book, uh, called The Mission of God's People, Chris Wright writes this. It's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the church, in the world. Just take some time to look at that. It's not so much that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission. It's not about our mission, it's about God's mission. And he's got us, we are here, to fit with God's mission, with what God's purposes are, with God's big picture of, for the world. So our first question has to be, what is God's mission for the church? What has he called us to partner with him doing. So that's, that's the key thing, isn't it? What is God's mission? Why did he make the world? Why did he make us? Why has he called us with him? What's his purpose about? We get that right, and we'll get everything else right as well. And when we ask that question, what is God's mission in the world that he's called to partner, 
partners to be partners with him in. We might immediately, I don't know what's come to your mind, um, but it might be passages like, and I think this is the case for many of us quite often, Matthew 28, the end of Matthew, where Jesus gave the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or we might go on into Acts chapter 1, uh, verses like uh, Acts 1 verse 8, where he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. That's the mission, to be his witnesses or to go and make disciples. Well, it does involve those things. But what I want to show you tonight and what we'll be showing you in the next couple of weeks, it does involve that. But you know what? It involves much more than that as well. And so we'll be trying to show the big picture of life behind the curtain. Paul gave that little illustration last week of if you're going to put on a put on a stage show and I, you have to be careful with these with these illustrations because I wouldn't want anybody to think that church is a stage show it's not but it works for this purpose when you have a stage show when we when you go along to watch the production you see what we see what happens on the stage don't we but before they can do the stage work there's a whole lot of preparation that goes on behind the scenes You've got your script writers. You've got your, the, the actors learn their lines. You've got, the, you've got all the people making the, the costumes and, the, and all the other things that go to making that stage production. What we're going to be doing is looking at what goes on behind the scenes to enable us to do the stuff in front of the stage, if you like. The, 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 the ministries that are public-facing, if I can put it that way, the preparation work that goes on behind the scenes, the bigger picture of life behind the curtain. So we start tonight with a, a, a whistle-stop tour, because I know that those of you who've been here, several of you said, Whoa, uh, you have to wake me up. Well, I hope I won't have to wake you up as we go through this evening, but we'll try and do a whistle-stop tour of God's mission on earth. What is God's mission? What's it all about? What was it start? Well, this will be familiar. I've done similar things to this before, but I hope this, you know, by going over it again, it will really Im embed it in our, our understanding of the, the big Bible story. The story starts, obviously, with creation. God's story, God's mission starts in Genesis chapter 1, and it ends at Revelation chapter 22. I'll tell you why that's really important in a moment. It will become clear. His mission starts in Genesis 1. What do we learn in Genesis chapter 1? We discover why we are here. Genesis chapter 1 isn't a, a scientific textbook. It's an explanation for the purposes of the earth. It talks about forming and it talks about filling. How God made it. And it, it doesn't try to explain it. It doesn't, it's not there to tell us and give us a textbook of the scientific explanation of the times and, and how longs and all of that. It's enough for us to know that God did it. And, and our role as human beings in that. It tells us, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, tell us that his intention was for the world to be good to be filled with good things and for us to work with him. The pinnacle of his creation, to be partners with God in managing and drawing out all the wonderful resources that God had, had made the world with. He made it good and he made us to rule it under him, to rule it, to manage it for him, to keep it good, to maintain it, to develop it, to realize all its potential that he'd invested into it as he made it. Those two chapters answer the existential question of why are we here? What's it all about? Why, why do human beings exist? If you take God out of the question, you don't have an answer to that question. Well, we just evolved, and we're just another creature 
which is part of the big thing. You take the Bible and it gives a great dignity to human beings. It says we're here specifically by God with a specific role and a specific purpose to manage. He made us a little lower, a little lower than the angels. Made us special. That means you're special, each of you tonight. God made you. You're not an accident. God made you with a, with a purpose to run and to rule and to live with him. This, this is our starting point. This was his mission. He made the world. It would reflect his glory. The heavens declare the glories of God. They declare his handiwork. The earth is full of the goodness of God. He made us to work with him. His mission was to have a world that was good, a world that was perfect in, in every way. And our role as I've said, was to keep it that way in every respect. Now, that's really important. I'm going to come back to that again next week, all being well. So it starts with creation. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. So, all right, it's not going to take us this long to go through the whole of the Bible tonight. We're not going to take this long on every chapter. Genesis 3 is the next big thing. So you've got creation, and then you've got what we call the fall. And... It's about our, our rebellion against God. It describes how we rejected, as, as a human race, we rejected God. We fell from that position of relationship with God, working with him, co-workers with God, rebelled against him. Our, we disobeyed him, and that changed everything. And often the mistake that we can make is to think that God's mission starts in Genesis chapter 3 which is why I've emphasized that it starts in Genesis 1 with his creation, that it was good. That's God's original intention. But it was messed up in Genesis chapter 3 by our willful rebellion and disobedience to him. It changed everything. It changed the world physically. It changed the world intellectually. It changed society. And it changed the world spiritually as well. Physically, in that death and decay came in, into the environment, into nature, into our human life and thinking and being. It changed us physically, so we die. We, we live and we die and we decay. That wasn't there beforehand. It changes, changed things intellectually. Instead of using our wonderful intellect to serve God and to tend his world and to develop it and to explore it, we as a race, now use our intellect to abuse God's world, to use it for our own ends instead of for God's ends. We use it to explain our intellect. We use it to explain away God, to say why God can't exist. There was social change. Relationships broke down. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed him. And within a couple of chapters, we see murder. We see ethnic uh, division, we see racial tensions, and there was, of course, spiritual change. We became alienated from God. Do you know the story? You, you know how when sin came in, they, had, they were sent out from the garden, and an angel was put guarding the way so they couldn't get back in. Mankind and God were separated. There was enmity. We became his enemies. And we see the effect of this all around us in the world today. Our world is fallen from the way that God made it. You see it, don't you? It's a broken world. We see death and decay all around us. It's a dying world. What did God do? What was God's response to this rejection? What was God's response to this tragic fall because it goes on the first 11 chapters are just full of uh, unremitting failure what did God do did he wash his hands of it screw it up and decide I'm going to start again he didn't his mission remained his mission was to have a perfect world in which everything and everyone lived together in unison and harmony and that mission remained. It didn't change when sin came in. It didn't, it didn't change when the world was broken down and the physical change and the intellectual change and the social change and the spiritual change. It didn't change. 
And so whilst he got pretty close to destroying it all and starting again, you've only got to think of chapter 6 and Noah's flood. You don't get much nearer to total wipeout than that, do you? There was just one family that he left out of all of the, the people that were around on earth. He, he got pretty close, but he didn't destroy it. He found a man and his family that in his eyes were righteous, and he started again. What did God do? We've got creation, we've got the fall, but what we see throughout Scripture is we see that God chose redemption. He chose to redeem his world. Rather than start again, he chose to redeem it. He chose not to destroy it, but to renew it. And as I say, after 11 chapters of unremitting failure, two starts that had utterly failed, we've seen creation. We've mentioned Noah. It didn't take long for the descendants of Noah to fall into similar chaos, similar rejection of God. As they built the Tower of Babel, they said, let us make ourselves, we'll become gods ourselves. We get to chapter 12. And we see God starting again, redeeming his world through this man, Abram. And the chapter starts with God telling Abram to go from your country, from your people and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. But we need to have those, that verse, those words engraved on our hearts. All the nations, all the peoples on earth, blessed through you. I will make you a great nation. So he leaves with that promise ringing in his ears. You see, God's plan was that through Abram, Abram and his family, he would get his mission of this perfected world, this renewed, this redeemed world, he'd get it back on track. He'd get it back to how things were meant to be originally. All that the world that was broken in the world would be fixed. Physically, socially, intellectually, spiritually. Through this man and his family, God would put it right. When he says, I will bless you and I'll make you a blessing to all the world. It means nothing less than this renewed, redeemed, perfected state. The rest of the Old Testament then charts God's dealings with these people, the descendants of Abraham. How they grew into a family and ended up going down to live in Egypt. How after a few hundred years they uh, ended up in slavery. How then God works with Moses and he, what did he do? He rescued them, he redeemed them out from slavery, out from Egypt. He takes them on their way. He says, I'm going to take you to a land that's your own. They didn't have a country before. They didn't have a land they could call their own. But now there are a, a people of about two and a half million. He says, you're going to have your own land. And on the way to this land, they stop at Sinai. And at Sinai, they make, or God makes a covenant with them. There is this agreement. He says, if you will be my people, if you will obey my ways, if you will follow me, I will bless you. Well, if God said that to you, wouldn't you agree? If God came to you and said, you do this and I'm going to look after you, I'll protect you, I'll prosper you, I'll give you everything that you could ever imagine. Of course you're going to say yes, and they said yes. And he gave them the Ten Commandments, and the books of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, flesh those out for us. They were, going to, they were the legislative uh, documents, the framework on which that nation was to, to live. And we'll come back and we'll reference this because what God was doing was creating a people. His recreating, his desire was to recreate a people as they were meant to be originally, a people distinct for God in the midst of a world that had rejected him. Here would be a people 
that would reflect and show the nature, the character, the benefits of doing things God's way where he'd been rejected all around. This was the big idea. They would be his representatives. They would be different. They would, they would enjoy the benefits of being God's people, living under his rule, whilst at the same time being beacons of light and truth and righteousness in the world. The people would look at the nation of Israel as they became known. They would look at them and they would see this, this nation who honoured God, who lived by God's way, and they would see the benefits of, of following God. They, they would be, therefore, by their living, attracting people to him. By the way they talked, they'd be calling people to him. That was God's design for Israel to be part of his renewed mission on earth. Sadly, over and over again, they failed. And yet, despite that repeated failure, God did not leave them and he did not reject them. Instead, what he did, he sent them prophets to call them back. And as they rejected the prophets, he said, there's going to be one coming. There's going to be a Messiah coming. I'm going to send you another rescuer. There will be one coming that will set things right. That through whom I'm going to establish this new kingdom. And so we move into the New Testament because that one, that, that Messiah that they spoke about, that you read your prophets and particularly look in Isaiah and Jeremiah and you see these wonderful promises of the servant that's going to come. Isaiah 53, anyone? We often read that and commune in communion and those kind of times. It's all about Jesus. And so we move into the, into the New Testament. We get to the coming of Jesus. Jesus comes, this one from God, God with us, Emmanuel. And we see him as we go through the New Testament, teaching people, calling, him, calling people to him. What he called the new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And his time climaxed here with his death and his resurrection. His death and his resurrection opened up a new exodus where people had been slaves in Egypt and he rescued them into the promised land where they should have lived for him. They should have been this great example. The death and the resurrection of Jesus opened the way for a new exodus, a spiritual exodus for all those who would come to love him and trust him, for those who would honour him and respect him as Lord, who would become the new people of God. And gave us the Holy Spirit to help us live this new way, the way that he had set up. And then he leaves to heaven, for heaven. And what does he do? He does the same as he did with Abraham. He says, go. Go into all the world and make disciples. He says, go and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. He says, go and call people to to join you, go and be an example. And often we stop at that point. I think that's it. That's what, we're, that's what we're here for. That's the purpose of the church. But I want to suggest to you, it is that, but then it's something else as well. There's more because that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is Revelation 21 and 22. The end of the story is not when Jesus comes again for judgment and he just separates from heaven and hell. The end of the story is the new heaven and the new earth. I want to read just a few verses for you in, and you can turn with, them, with me to them if you like in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. Because this is where it's all leading to. You see, we can, if we're not careful, think that what we're about is simply seeing people saved from their sin and getting into heaven. Well, that would be as if the story, the mission, starts at Genesis 3 and ends at Revelation 20, which is the judgment. But what we've seen tonight is it starts at Genesis 1 with creation. And what I want to show you is it finishes at 21 and 22 with the new, Genesis 21, with the new creation, with the renewing and putting things back to how they were originally meant to be. And so we've got here in chapter 21, 
I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Do you notice where this new heaven comes from? It comes from, it comes down. It comes down. Where does it come to? It comes to this earth. God's plan isn't simply that we go and float on clouds. His mission was to have a world that reflected him, a world that was good with people that managed it with him. It failed in Genesis 3. It failed in Genesis 6. It failed with Israel, but it will succeed with the whole people of God. It will succeed. Because when Jesus comes back, he will deal with sin. He will deal with Satan. And those who've known him, those who've loved him, will live with him forever on this new, perfected, renewed world. What is our mission? What is God's mission to the earth? It is to have this perfect world with his people. That's what he's called us for. This is our job. This is what his mission is. Is He's called us to be part of it with him. It's not simply about seeing people saved from their sin. It is that, but it's more. It is that we would be part of this total renewal of everything. A renewed community shaped by him. A community to care for his creation. A community to embody that which is right and fair. A community that is to call others to follow Jesus. A community that will rule with him ultimately on the renewed earth. This is our mission. This is what we're part of. And hopefully you can see from this that the behind the curtain part, the preparation part, the the what we are is more important than what we do. The character, our character is more important than the reaching out. I'm not saying the reaching out isn't important. But if we don't get the character right, then we're missing half of what God has called us for. We're called to be this new community that embodies and shows and demonstrates all of the character of God, shaped to be like him. We're called to be like him. Be holy, for I am holy. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through week by week. What we are, how we're to live, how we speak, how we relate to each other, as well as to the Lord, is a crucial part of our mission. So what is our mission? It's to be in line with God. It is to be the people that God called us to be, as well as to do the things that he called us to do. We are to be, he's called us to be his people, his co-workers in his world, following his ways, modeling his character, to be his witnesses, that others would come and join. It's a big call, isn't it? But what a huge privilege It is to be part of God's people. I can't see from your faces whether that excites you or not. (laughs) I just think that's the most wonderful thing. Because it means it's not just about here and there. It's just not just about getting by in life. It's about this eternity, ultimately, of being with him. Called to be with him, live with him, enjoy his creation for all time. It's a glorious thing. Well, may God help us and shape us to live like that now and to look forwards to that glorious eternity that we have, being with him on the renewed heaven, in the renewed heavens and on the renewed earth, working co-workers with him 
always bringing glory for him. That's it for tonight. We're done. I'm going to pray. I've got a few things that I'd like us to pray for specifically. Uh, I'm going to just go pray into this, what we've talked about tonight. Um, we'd like to pray for Ian. Uh, he's hopefully got his hip op. I want to say hip hop. Um, but he's got his hip operation, hopefully on Friday. He's on Zoom. Ian, I want to pray for you, mate. Uh, I haven't got my screen, so I can't see who else is on Zoom, who's on Zoom. Ian, we want to pray for you. I want to pray that it will happen. Um, you know these things, and quite often it happens like Ian's had this week. They get all prepped up, and then it doesn't happen. We want to pray that it will happen, because Ian is in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. I want to pray for that. Uh, I'd like to pray for Fiona's Gary. Uh, he's really bumping along the bottom with long COVID. He's really knocked out of things, just low energy uh, it's just really hard. I'd like us to bring him together to the Lord. Um, I'd like us to pray and thank God for Peter and Bridget. It's easier to do that when they're not here. They're on holiday. And boy, they deserve it, don't they? Uh, I want to pray and thank God for them that it will be a time of refreshment and a time of, you know, I could say recovery. <laughs> but uh, the Lord knows what I mean in that. But the time, the energy, the, the, what they've given into all of this. Uh, I want to thank God for them and pray God's blessing on them. But we're not, we're not there quite yet, are we? And uh, we, I'd like us to pray that the Lord will uh, lead us to the right places or touch our pockets or whatever it is that needs so that we get that extra bit of finance to finish off uh, the building that we're in. Let's pray for our village. I talked to you this morning about the, the Jubilee celebrations, uh, that uh, part of which myself and Paul uh, are on the committee trying to organize that. Um, and it, it's introduced us to a whole range of people that we haven't seen and we, we wouldn't have known uh, otherwise or it would have taken us a while to get to know them. And just like to pray for our village uh, and its well-being and uh, pray nationally and internationally as well as we continue. I'm sure uh, you're like me, you just watch every day and you get these, these images and you hear these awful things that are going on in Ukraine and uh, we just want to bring that to the Lord as well. Let's just pause as we finish tonight and bring these things to the Lord. Father, we've swept through your word from Genesis 1, literally Genesis 1, through to Revelation 22. As we've sought to Bring a perspective. Bring out your mission, what you're doing, what your plans are for this world and for your creation. And we've therefore seen your plan, your mission for your church in that. And we pray as we plan, as we live, as we meet, as we worship, as we sit under your word that we will fit in with that more and more and more. Help us to have that whole view of your mission. Lord, would you help us as your people to become more and more like you, that we would not let you down as Adam and Eve did, as the family of Noah did, as the, as the nation of Israel did. They all failed in that. Lord, we do not want to fail. We want to be those that are shining like a beacon. We want to be those, Lord, we would say to you tonight, we want to be those people. At least as much as we can be in this little village, we want to be those people that live according to your ways, that reflect your character, that increasingly become like you in our attitudes, in our actions, in our words, that we would be a beacon of light, a beacon of justice, a beacon of fairness, a beacon of graciousness, of kindness of gentleness of faithfulness that we might live these things out and others might see the benefits of and the, and the rightness and the goodness of yourself and would want to come and align themselves and and join your kingdom too lord we're 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 not saying this because we think we're any better than anyone else we are what we are because of your mercy and your grace to us 
because you called us, you saved us. It starts with you and it will end with you. But we would say that we want to be your people. We want it to be all about Jesus. So help us and shape us to be those people. Lord, even as we pray these, this big general prayer for ourselves, we would just bring one and another to you. We pray for our brother Ian tonight. We thank you so much for him. Thank you for his fortitude, for his grace and his patience over these last few months. We would ask that his operation would go ahead and would be a complete success on Friday. Be with him this week. Take away any anxiety or nerves. Be with the surgeons that they will, be, they will operate well. And uh, Lord, we lift him to you. We pray, Father, for Gary. There is no operation that can make him better. Lord, we would ask, have mercy. Would you, in your own unique, divine way, touch him? He wouldn't have a faith as, as Fiona does or we do, though he has a great respect for you. Lord, would you be merciful to him? Would you show him your reality? Would you touch his, his frail body at the moment? Renew it to the, the level of energy and strength. And Lord, would you then bring him to bow his knee before you? and honour you as Lord and God. That would be our greatest prayer for him, that he and Fiona would be one in the faith, that he would know you and love you. Oh God, hear our prayer for him tonight. Well, thank you for Peter and Bridget and ask for your blessing on them uh, in their holidays over in South Africa. Father, we thank you for their, their spirit, for their courage, for their faith, for their get up and do uh, for the way they, they're able to drive things through, the way that Peter never takes no for an answer. Father, we're, we're so grateful for him being part of our family here. And we would ask that whilst they're away, they'll bring refreshing and renewal of energy uh, as, they, as they need it and bring them back safely to us. We pray, our Father, for the finances that we need for, to finish this building. Lord, you, you know where it is. Uh, if it's in our pockets, then would you give us uh, humble and willing hearts and hands to take it out of our pockets and pop it into the, into the account. If it lies in somebody else's account, then Lord, would you touch their, ha their hearts, their hands, uh, to get it into our account, into your account, so that this building can be finished really soon. We want to pray for our village. We want this building. We want ourselves to be a, a light and a beacon to it, but we pray for it. And part of what we can do is to pray for it, to pray for prosperity, to pray, to pray for peace, to pray for your shalom on all of the people that are part of this community. For those in the school, for those in the uh, medical center, for those in the shop, for those in the social club, for our local councillors. Lord, we ask your touch on all of them. For our neighbours that live with us, for the neighbours around this place. Lord, we ask your graciousness, your kindness, your mercy, your blessing upon them. For those that don't know you, Father, we pray that you would reach out your hand and save them, draw them to yourself. And Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for the country of Ukraine. We pray for its leaders. We pray for peace in that land. We pray, Father, that you would withhold and with, uh, put your hand upon President Putin. We pray that you would cause him to, to see the, the error of, of what are surely his evil ways, the destructive, wanton destruction of a, of a nation, the pillaging of people's lives. Oh, God, we cry to you in mercy that you would thwart, that you would overturn the aggressors for those who are defending their nation, for those who are seeking to bring peace. The politicians, Lord, would you give them success? Hear our prayers as we bring them to you tonight. We thank you for this day. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for lunch. We thank you for what you've taught us in your word tonight. Now as we go to our homes, go with us, bless us. Give us a good night's sleep. And Lord, then help us as we live this week on the front line. Many of us isolated, the only Christians in the place where we work, in our families, in our schools, in the colleges that we go to. Lord, would you help us to live for you, bright, shining lights, we pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, 
the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today and always. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, if what we're saying on Sunday evenings, if it raises questions, uh, uncertainties, um, things you'd like just developed a little bit more, let us know. Uh, we can incorporate them into future uh, Sunday evenings, or we can answer them on the spot, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, if it raises questions, then by all means, uh, fire them away. 